Major funding for this program was provided by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the California Council for the Humanities. And by the Louisiana Division of the Arts. Much of America's history has disappeared from our country's consciousness, and often it is this history that explains what, where, and who we are. There was a time when over 200 utopian colonies blossomed in America, separated in many ways, but united in one common aspiration, to provide a better way of life for the millions of people displaced and disenfranchised by the Industrial Revolution. For these millions, the American dream had failed. Some joined the fledgling labor unions and new political parties, and some started afresh in communities of their own design. Llano del Rio was the last of the great American utopians, and the history of utopia has largely been written as a history of failure you know, misguided, uh, naive idealism. But in fact, utopianism has been absolutely essential to the American experience. America's history is punctuated by these utopias, beginning with the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. But it is the phenomenal numbers of utopian colonies that sprang up in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Places like Clarion, Utah, Roycrofters in East Aurora, New York, Freedom Colony in Kansas, Puget Sound Colony, and Fairhope, Alabama, whose histories and import have been largely ignored and forgotten. Llano del Rio Cooperative Colony, America's longest live socialist utopia, began with the vision of a man you have never heard of. This man was Job Harriman. I opened the door and there stood a man. He said, I am Job Harriman. Now I had often heard of Mr. Harriman. He was a leading lawyer in the state of California. He was the champion for the labor movement, the defender of the poor, the dispossessed, the unfortunate, and of the moneyless man. I do not exactly believe his theory would be successful, but it was so filled with romance that I agreed to think it over. He said this, if you will join me and a few other of my friends, we will build a city and homes for many a homeless family. We will show the world a trick or two they do not know. Harriman had already shown the world a trick they did not know, and that was how to unite labor unions and socialists to work together for a common goal. In 1911, Harriman, a one-time gubernatorial and vice presidential candidate, a man who believed in the electoral process, was favored to win the upcoming mayoral election in Los Angeles. You have to remember, Los Angeles in 1910 had a quarter million, maybe half a million people, and when Job Harriman marched down Broadway, 40 or 50,000 people marched behind him. That means that there was a tremendous amount of wide popular support for the concept of socialism. At stake was the future of labor capital relations on the West Coast. Los Angeles was the key, and both the leaders of labor and the leaders of capital knew it. The Los Angeles Times, the bastion anti-union paper in the city owned by city boss Harrison Gray Otis was bombed and over 20 workers were killed. Within hours, Times publisher Otis was pointing the finger at the unions that had been striking his paper on and off for 20 years and crying anarchy. You can't underestimate the problems he had uh, at the colony with the opposition that he uh, aroused from General Otis of the Los Angeles Times, because General Otis was um, a particularly villainous and powerful character, whereas the cities back east had, you know, I guess Tammany Hall and there were these city machines. In Los Angeles, there was only one man who decided everything, and that was General Otis. By 1910, Job Harriman was probably the best known labor attorney in Los Angeles. And after the McNamara bombing, it was the uh, perception of organized labor 
that they were being framed, that the McNamaras were innocent. And so they turn, they being organized labor, to the best known attorney uh, in the city. In the primary, Job Harriman had uh, shocked the opposition by almost winning. He did not quite receive 50% of the votes in the primary. This frightened the opposition half to death, especially Harrison Gray Otis in the Los Angeles Times. But the McNamara brothers were guilty. They deceived both Harriman and his co-counsel, Clarence Darrow. A deal was struck. The prosecution, together with the, with the Los Angeles Times and Harrison Gray Otis, who certainly played a role, insisted that the switch and plea take place prior to the mayorality election. Unfortunately, Job Harriman was never a party to the to the negotiations that must have taken place between Clarence Darrow and the prosecution. You must remember that the switch and plea took place on a Friday and that the mayorality election occurred the following Tuesday. The Los Angeles Times strategy worked. Joe Harriman was defeated in the election. Otis, in a single powerful move, had annihilated socialism at the polls on the West Coast. The question was, what do we do next? He came to the conclusion that you can't win an election, you can't win real power um, from the ruling class. They won't let you have it even if you have the people behind you. They always will find a way to stop you. I think at that point he reverted more to his Christian socialist roots and out of it came the utopian colonies. Harriman set about forging together the most radical reform ideas of his day as the basis for an experimental colony, an eight-hour workday, a guaranteed livable wage, child care, equal education and cultural opportunities, health care for all, and food, shelter, clothing in exchange for a day's work. On May Day, 1914, Llano del Rio Cooperative Colony officially opened its gates just 45 miles northeast of Los Angeles in the Antelope Valley. It began in, in 1914 and it continued until 1918. And in that period, it succeeded in drawing uh, almost a thousand colonists at its height. Let us go onto the land, let us go into the West, let us create this model society. Because Americans are very oriented toward deeds as opposed to thoughts in my mind. Americans want to see an idea in action. If we can show that the, this idea in action works, then the better mousetrap has been found and Americans love a better mousetrap. I'm desirous of becoming one of the colonists. I was graduated from high school last February and find myself unable to advance farther. For this reason, I would like to be placed at something which would help me better myself. I am very truly yours, Mr. Gentlemen, I am a single man of 26 years old, strong and able. Would also consider getting married if circumstances permit. Yours very truly, Dear Joseph comrades, Placer. we would willingly and gladly sacrifice everything we have to get into the colony and live in a tent until you saw fit to give us a house. Dear friends, I've read about your colony, and I will be glad if I can be admitted as one of your members. I am a tinsmith of 38 years. I speak a little English, but I understand it better in speaking and reading. Enclosed is a reference. I am a socialist for all my life. My best wish to the Yano Cooperative Colony. Death in your colony. That's what I wish. From Giuseppe Fantoni. P.S. Keep the photo if you wish. If you're a good carpenter, we need you. Uh, if, if you're good uh, around animals, we need you. If you're good in terms of uh, agriculture, we need you, and so on. Um, so I think it was, and they all displayed a certain amount of, of idealism in the sense that they, they wanted to believe what they were led to believe about the colony. When I saw that little bunch of dirty tents strung out on the sand after I bumped over the boulders of big rock wash, I said, for God's sake, is this the place? That was my first impression. I was now with a bunch of idealists, readers, and students who were interested in what was going on in the world. Life began to be very, very interesting. They're all socialists, you might say. And they were for the union, you know, and Social Security and old age pension. That's what, that's all they talked about. 
way before you ever heard of, heard of it, before Roosevelt ever looked at it. Within two years, Yano had a canning factory, thousands of pear trees and alfalfa fields planted, a fish hatchery and a rug shop. The colony continued to recruit new members aggressively. Throughout its 25-year history, the colony's publishing efforts were its pride and their beacon to the world. Upton Sinclair, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Carl Sandburg, Jack London, and Erskine Caldwell were among the writers published in the colony papers. They published two publications. There was the Yano Colonist, which was a weekly and basically dealt with life at the colony, but it was very handsomely gotten up. And then there was the Western Comrade, which had a uh, very, very wide national circulation and was just an incredibly gorgeous publication that dealt with issues, um, you know, more of interest to people uh, throughout the country. In order to be interested in Yano, you pretty much had to be uh, a counterculture type. Whether you were a rich counterculture, poor counterculture, you had to be there. You had to be real uh, politically aware. There were politically aware farmers, mechanics. Uh, originally, a lot of the people came from the, uh, the socialist bent trade unions. And yet the vast majority of colonists identified themselves as mainstream, patriotic Americans. I never heard but, but two different people knock the United States there that I remember. It didn't knock the United States. Like some people thought we, we was bucking the United States, but, but uh, you know, it was just a, just change the system a little. And that was all. Whereas many colonists at Yano were socialists, it was certainly not a, it wasn't a litmus test. It wasn't a requirement, per se. You, you, and there were some who were not, and I think who said they were not and who didn't share necessarily all of the socialist uh, uh, aspirations. I think they were practically minded people. I don't think they're there for any other reason. You know, they thought it was a good living, no worry, no taxes, no thing like that. They liked it. They liked the life. I was used as an all-around man during this month and had a pretty strenuous time of it, though I must admit I enjoyed it hugely. And like nearly every new comrade, full of enthusiasms and likewise, put my shoulder to the wheel and my heart in the enterprise, determined to make a success of the proposition. While children from poor families worked in sweatshops and roamed the big city slums, the Yano colony had a primary commitment to education and to preparing their young for productive lives. To me, Yano must have been just like heaven for kids. It must have just been wonderful because you had horses, you had sheep, you had goats, rabbits. You had places to go hiking. The idea behind Yano was to stimulate education. So uh, unlike regular public schools, you would go to school and they'd say, uh, like Harold Matthewson, for example, they said, design and build a water wheel for us because we need water. So he designed it and he built it. He was maybe 16, 15, something like that. And that's a neat project for a kid. Dear Comrade Barber, we are making splendid progress in all ways at the colony. The timber concession, which will allow us to get lumber in the U.S. Forest Reserve, has proven a great benefit to us. The brickyard is piling up a great quantity of building material. This gives us about all that is needed for the construction of our new city. Alice Austin was essentially given the assignment by Harriman and some of the other people at the colony to um, create an entire new city from scratch. And she really went to town. I mean, she produced some wonderful models and artist sketches. Several Fresno families came last week, the Picketts and Chamberlains, Doc Williams and a few others. Mr. Pickett brought a player piano. We now have three pianos in the dining room. It's generally believed that the socialists moved to Yano primarily because of the Holocaust surrounding the McNamara trial uh, and the defeat of the socialists in the 1912 election. But I think an equally, if not more powerful force, was the national recession that preceded the First World War. By now, over a thousand colonists had flocked to Yano, but it was too many, too fast. 
Food shortages, internal bickering, and cash flow problems strained the cooperative spirit. As a percentage of loafers that thought that when they paid their dues to join that they could sit around the rest of their lives. You know, they had that in their mind. And so there was a little friction there, you know. Well, socialist communities in general have not been good at screening members. That's been one of their problems. Religious communities are marvelous, and that's why they do better. Uh, religious communities can say, either you believe as we believe or don't come. And the socialist community is more willing to say, we are... We are a democratic group, we are broad-minded, we'll take in a lot of different kinds of people and we will show how democracy, how, how the, the society can work. There was not just friction and loafing, there was endless debate over every detail of colony life. In a sense, Yano suffered from too much democracy. Harriman was not a czar, that was part of a problem, he was too democratic. I mean, everybody talks about the General Assembly meetings that were what is it, Wooster said, uh, democracy with the lid blown off. One night, the whole assembly wrangled until they forgot what they were arguing over. Some had Robert's rules of order, some had Cushing's rules, some had a loud voice. One old man got to his feet and said, Job, this is a lot of damn nonsense. You're the one who got us all out here. Now tell us what you want us to do and let's get at it. Poor Job was dragooned into being a dictator against all his principles. He was called general manager. Yano's success was felt also in its voting strength, and this threatened the power of local ranchers. They got in trouble with some of the local ranchers who had never really used the water, but now that somebody else wanted it, they wanted it. And water's the most important thing to Southern California. Between problems with their neighbors over water rights, their own internal bickering, and the agitation of the Los Angeles Times, the Yano colonists found themselves besieged. Today, if it hadn't been for the LA Times, that place was gone, and they'd been had water by the time they needed it by putting down deep wells. It's a crime. The Los Angeles Times did a rotten job. There's no reason in and of itself, apart from the implacable opposition of the Los Angeles Times and the other powers that be, that Yana might not have thrived. It might still be a, a kibbutz out in the Mojave Hobby Desert today. To survive it all, the colony would have to move. Harriman and the board of directors found a new location with water aplenty. Located in West Louisiana was a played out lumber mill town that the Gulf Lumber Company wanted to sell, called Stables. On a fall day in 1917, nearly 200 Yano colonists loaded themselves onto a chartered train with the hardware of their many businesses, including a complete sawmill, and Harold Mathewson's carefully packed motorcycle, his first, a gift from his mother. Worcester and I went ahead on the train to get there ahead of the big crowd. After we were there a few days, the train that was chartered full of Yano people arrived. That was the beginning of the period of Yano's activity in the piney woods of Louisiana. We were now in the deep south. It was a big loss. It cost a lot of money to take that train and move them. It cost thousands of dollars. And uh, no money to replenish it. I lived in the same house with Mr. Harriman, and night after night we would discuss the problems of the colony. The year 1919 was one of excessively heavy rainfall. Many people were sick. We were both agreed that it was very doubtful if the necessary changes could be brought about soon enough to avert the disaster which we saw coming. Harriman had literally worked himself to death. The southern climate aggravated his tuberculosis, and the doctor ordered him to leave. In 1924, the colony bid farewell to Job Harriman. He died the following year in Los Angeles. Yano had lost its founder and its first home. The Yano Del Rio cooperative colony was on the verge of collapse. But if Harriman was gone, others still believed. At the moment when most utopian colonies fail, George T. Pickett, former coach, real estate broker, and insurance salesman, bristling with American pragmatism, found ways to revitalize the colony, its membership, and its ideals. Pickett was a marvelous salesman on selling uh, this. I, I don't think it could have been done without him. 
Uh, he just had a way, and he had an energy about him. If I understand right, the first people had to pay $2,000 to buy a membership in the piano. Okay, well, they, George reduced it down to $1,000. Okay, and he used to make these lecture trips all over the United States. Uh, as I said one time before, I, I traveled, my mother told me I traveled over 75,000 miles before I was five years old. To the beleaguered colonists, Pickett's street smarts and new approach made sense. He emphasized the cooperative nature of the colony. Our program embodies many of the theories of socialism, but we have had to discard many of the theories advocated by socialists. We are practicing integral cooperation. We have no isms and don't want any. Things were beginning to look up, and the colonists had one piece of extraordinary luck, and that was in having picked Louisiana itself. Here again, we cross an arena where American history has been rewritten. Louisiana, thought by the rest of the country to be backward and ultra-conservative, had in fact provided Eugene Debs and Harriman more socialist votes per capita in the 1900 presidential election than almost any state in the Union. Moreover, West Louisiana was not less, but more radical than Harriman's own Socialist Party, having rallied against the lumber mill owners in the early 20th century behind the arch-radical leadership of Bill Haywood and the industrial workers of the world. The people in Louisiana, particularly the West Louisiana at that time, were uh, heavily socialist to begin with, heavily uh, cooperationist to begin with. In 1916, the year before they arrived here, the industrial workers of the world, the forestry union, finally gave up, leaving behind them literally thousands and thousands of people who were blacklisted from uh, employment in the lumber industry. This was an area in which the Yano colonists came and found people who knew who they were, understood them. Pickett's tireless fundraising and recruiting efforts succeeded. These people became the new pioneers of Yano, willing to put up with the discomforts of the young colony. Many who couldn't come became loyal contributors. For the rest of their lives, these cooperators, socialists, Yankees, and immigrants, would adopt of all places West Louisiana as their home, sweet home. It was like one big family. You were thrown constantly with each other day after day, mealtime, working together. It was social activities together. It, it was just you were you were const you were with people so much till they were just like a part of your family. My uh, parents never told us much about it until we uh, packed up to move on, and we, and we moved on uh, July fourth, nineteen eighteen. And we arrived in the colony in August, August 21st, 1918. My mother shot rabbits for rabbit stew for supper on the way to, to the colony. She was a good shot. Well, there are no churches in Yana Colony, but there were no uh, liquor stores, there were no bars, there were no houses of prostitution. The sheriff was asked, Demps Turner was asked, uh, how about the people in New Yano, and he says, if everybody in Vernon Parish behaved like they do, I'd be out of a job. When families came there, the the wife would work in one section, maybe at the, in the kitchen or in the in the hotel part. They were not dependent on the husbands like they were when they worked on the farm. There were some that separated. My parents were one of them. It was not because the the colony uh, was an organization that sponsored separation of them, but rather it was it was marriages that had failed already. And when they came there, there was a means of the wife separating. Three of my brothers married women from the colony, and none of them were less than 50 years of married life. The nearby Leesville residents were fascinated by their new neighbors, but critically for the colony's success, unlike in California, the Louisianians did accept them as neighbors. See, most people, we didn't know much about socialism, communism, things like that. Uh, 
but I don't. Our our relations with New Lano was very good. It was real good. We traded a lot with New Lano. They buy ice there. They bought lumber there. They, if they needed machine work done, they took it there to get it done. New Lano had their own cannery. If you had a, if you butchered a beef, and you wanted it canned, you could take it there and they'd can it, and they took their share of it and give you the rest. One of the things they added to the, to the economy of the region, was talent, uh, tra uh, people with trades, with 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 skills. Uh, the level of, of, of skill among the colonists in Alana was probably, you know, stages higher than the general population there. But the interaction between the Yano cooperators and their southern neighbors wasn't without incident. Shortly after their arrival, one of the colony bands was invited by their Leesville neighbors to perform patriotic music for a Red Cross benefit. We was playing and thinking nothing about it. All of a sudden, there was a commotion in the crowd. Somebody got up on a chair and shouted, play Dixie for Christ's sakes, play Dixie. We didn't know what was the matter. We played Dixie all right without stopping to hunt for the music. The crowd was getting noisy and everybody was getting out of their seats. A man yelled, get a rope. It began to look pretty bad, so we grabbed our instruments and music stands and scattered like fish. The next day, we found out what was the matter. We were playing Sherman's song, marching through Georgia. We didn't know it was a crime. We were innocent as a bunch of babies. They thought we were a free love colony. And that even showed up in print, the Leesville leader. I guess because so many of the kids called my father dad. I don't know. I called our orchestra leader dad. He was an elderly man, and uh, it was out of respect we called him dad. Women found themselves in a new position in the colony. They were free to choose what they wanted to do. If you didn't like housework, and didn't like to wash, and didn't like to iron, and didn't like to sew, all of that was done for you. You sent your laundry to the to the every week, and, and it was washed and ironed, and, and if it needed mending, it was sent to the sewing room. The children were well taken care of. A mother stayed home with a child until it was six months old. She had that choice. A lot of the women worked in, in industry. Our, one of our best uh, sawmill operators was a young woman. I mean, there was no separation there. I worked in the print shop when I was 14. I wanted to set type, so I set type for a while. Then I started to run the job presses, but that's not what I wanted. I really wanted the linotype. They gave me a, a false keyboard, told me to take it home and study it. So now I started to work the linotype. That's what I wanted. So I was. Until I left the colony, I was on the line of type. I took jobs that I couldn't possibly have taken if I hadn't had the experience there. I even got a job as a machinist in the city of New York. I hadn't been there more than a week or so, and I got a job. And this was in 1933, when jobs were hard to come by. I don't know of anyone who went on relief. And I kept track of uh, quite a few that had left the colony. And we always prided ourselves on the fact that no one that grew up in the colony went on relief. One of the strongest aspects in Yano culture was the importance of a social life that working people could enjoy. Very early in the days of the colony, Job Harriman laid down the policy that social life should not be commercialized. Wherever people gathered, somebody had musical instruments.
Soon they began to have regular dances, and it was a very wholesome crowd. The orchestra was not paid. It was the same with a dramatic company. There was always a group somewhere rehearsing a play. I wish people had round dances today. And then on May Day, they had a special dance that they did on May Days. But everybody participated, young and old alike, and it was sight just back home from watching. You didn't have to participate, just watch. And uh, so a lot of the outsiders, that's the point I'm trying to get to, did come and join in in those social functions. The dancers was up on what they call the roof garden. It must have been at least 75 feet square. And it was not walled up all the way around. It was walled up about four feet high. And then from there to the ceiling was open, winter and summer. They had rules and regulations about their dances. There was no alcoholic beverages allowed. There was the big uh, brick pole up a column or whatever it was, was in the middle of the floor. And all, cause lots of people, when they'd get behind that, where Mr. Pickett couldn't see him, he was up there in the orchestra pit, you know, then get a little closer, you know, because if they caught you dancing closer than eight inches, you was called off of the floor. Ruby, which you introduced, she, she was a violinist and very, very good at it. And we had a lot of, a lot of and George Pickett was played trombone and mandolin. He was there right with us. It was the middle of the Depression, and a lot of people made uh, underclothes out of the sugar and the flour sacks. And there was one incident where a guy was dancing with this lady, and some way they got the her dress tail up, and right across her back it says 100% sugar. And the dance has lasted two hours from 8 till 10, and when 10 o'clock came, they played home sweet home. Education at the Louisiana Colony was as important as it had been in California. The older children went to school four hours a day and worked in some related industry, the other four. Every child was taught at least one musical instrument, usually two. Every child had the opportunity for dance. Every child had the opportunity to be in plays. And so they, their cultural things were so far advanced. Leesville area went down there regularly. They also had the first library in Vernon Parish. And it was open to the whole parish for a $1 membership for life. It was a far, far better school than the, the normal school. We went to school a half a day and then we worked in an industry or the garden the other half. And we were permitted to do anything that we wanted to do with the provision we could do it. And uh, I know that at uh, a very young age, I uh, had charge of a pumping plant, one of the shifts, fired the boiler, took care of the engines, pumping water to our rice fields. And I was only 17, 18 years old. We were told by most of our teachers that uh, learning things was of little importance unless you knew how to think. We had many discussions in the classroom, with, and uh, the fact that we disagreed with the teacher was fine. We didn't have any problem with that at all, but we had to substantiate our differences. The colonists were always learning. During the 1920s, thanks to soil analysis provided by Pickett's friend George Washington Carver, a series of satellite colonies were started to raise items that the mother colony couldn't produce in their soil. Colonists were free to rotate between sites at Premont, Texas, Gila, New Mexico, and the rice ranch in Elton, Louisiana. You couldn't find any better people. You know, they was all very intellectual and smart people willing to work for a common cause. Since I've grown up, i talked to lots of people that were youngsters there, and they said they never had a place in their life that had more pleasure than they did the colony and their folks too. Now, it's true, we've made mistakes, you know, like anybody does, but I can't, th I just can't think of us living any other kind of life. Maybe I should put it that way, that we were always struggling for what would better the world. 
Llano Colony prospered in the 1920s. They were one of the leading publishers of socialist newspapers in America. This prompted Kate Richards O'Hare to publish the highly esteemed American Vanguard at the colony for a time. Together, she and the colony founded the country's first cooperative university, the Commonwealth College. Theodore Cuno, one of the original founders of American Labor Day, became Llano Colony's chief patron. But then, Llano Colony and the rest of America ran at full speed upon a shoal. That shoal was the Great Depression. Between Lake Charles and Shreveport, there were about 26, 27 uh, mill towns in 1920. 1935, there were none. The depression which wrecked Detroit and New York that sent Wall Street financiers leaping out windows brought a tidal wave of indigents and families all hungry, looking for shelter in the already overburdened little utopia. One of the cutest stories was a man that came in, he lives in Illinois, told me um, about um, coming in on the train during the depression. He said, I didn't have anything to eat. I hadn't eaten in days. And he said, I had cardboard in my shoes. And I got off the train, and this is one of the things about Pickett that I admired. Uh, I think his board had told him, we can't accept any more you know, people in right now, you know, that are just going to come and stay that aren't paying membership. We're going to have to uh, let up on it because we barely have enough to take care of our own people. And Pickett said, no, as long as anyone is hungry or needs a place to sleep, we're not going to turn them down. And this man stayed. He said, they fed me, they gave me shoes, I had a place to sleep, I met the French teacher, and I married her. But many colony members resented Pickett for spending hard-won colony resources, feeding people who had contributed nothing. People are coming in here and not paying no membership to fall off the freight trains coming through here, coming in here, staying a week or two or a month or two to get fattened up, and then they leave again. Other people like my dad are coming in here and paying the membership so much for him, so much for us kids. It was fair about it. One of my friends, I'm not going to mention any names, said that they came to the colony because the colony took care of old people, which was true. But you don't just come to the colony and expect to sit on the porch on a rocker and not contribute anything. And they, that's what they expected. So naturally, they weren't very happy there to find out they had to work. And then she tells me, but after all, people are old at 40. I says, come on. I said, my father wasn't old at 70. So that's the attitude of many people who came and contributed nothing, not even a good day's work. That there was a man with his family, his wife and daughter, came down that street with a two-horse wagon. And he stopped and asked my brother-in-law where the colony was. And he said, you just keep going to where you're going, and it's about two miles from here. And he thanked him and went on. He, get, he gave him his team, his wagon and everything, for stocking New Lano. And after he joined it, he didn't like what he saw. Of course, he done not give away his team. And in a few days, he passed back by that grocery store that my brother-in-law run. And he told him, he said, I'm going back home because I didn't like what I saw. And he was afoot. You know what I mean by being afoot? You're walking. Even under the stresses of the Depression, Pickett and his followers continued to hold things together. But some of the colonists felt Pickett ran roughshod over their interests. Again, every detail of colony life became a debate. You know, even our founding father said that democracy is the least efficient form of government. Well, here these people are trying to make a living in an impoverished atmosphere, you might say. You haven't got time for everybody to put in their ideas, but they did. To allow colonists to vent their frustrations, Pickett established what were called psychology meetings. Some of these meetings served also to discredit anyone who disagreed with Pickett. 
he knew that uh, the people wasn't going to, all of them wasn't going to do what he wanted them to do. And he got up there at, at the, what to call the psych meeting, and he told them uh, what they, what he thought they ought to do, and what they hadn't, he thought they oughtn't to do. Well, some of them get up there and uh, they'd argue with him, take up the time that ought to have been spent on something more productive. I mean, Pickett was obviously just a very different person than Harriman, and I don't think intellectually it always on the same level. Pickett was the czar that Harriman was accused of being. I mean, I think he knew how to run the colony with an iron hand, and I think it's just what he did. I think Pickett was a pretty straight fellow. Pretty straight fellow. You go to him and deal with him properly, tell him the, the lowdown on anything you were thinking, and uh, he'll give you consideration. As the situation worsened, Pickett again went on the road to get new members, and especially new money. With Pickett away, the discontented, many ex-Pickett friends and supporters determined to turn him out of office, legally or illegally. I was seven years old when they had the revolution in, in 1935. Uh, this little book, this Christ of Vienna colony tells what happened. Now, George was up in Washington trying to get something done. I took sides with a part who was dissatisfied with the way that it was run. And uh, the majority of the people felt they was right and wanted to make a change. So uh, we more or less overthrowed the ones in power and took over. George would not relinquish his leadership. They went down and bodily went in there and picked him up and threw him over the banister, threw him off that porch out of his office. Well, we put Pickett out of power here and took over because people felt like he wasn't doing a job that needed to be done. He was running all over the country, living in these hotels and motels, and here we are back here eating rice and beans. Howard Young, son of uh, Sid Young, was kind of posted there as guard, and he had a he had George's 32 automatic. And they left him there to stand guard, so we couldn't get the records to see what money was owed, what money we had coming in, or stuff like that. They came in. They were going to take over the the office, and they had just one man, uh, this Howard Young, and this whole crowd went in there, and uh, I think Howard shot a couple of times in the ceiling to scare him off, and they wrestled with him and it's out old Charlie left in the leg. Threats were made. There were acts of sabotage. There had never been trouble at Yano, not a single arrest in its 20 odd years. One of the principals behind the revolution was Doc Williams, who had joined the colony in California with Pickett. The revolutionaries selected him as the new general manager. If Christ had his Judas, so did George. George had two of them. One was Doc Williams, and the other one, it was a. James McDonald. But Williams, McDonald, and the other revolutionaries had legitimate complaints. And Pickett, who had saved the colony when Job Harriman left, had many loyal followers. Friend turned against friend. Dear Alice, I am mighty sorry matters are as they are here. We are in separate camps, and any getting together would be interpreted as anything but the disinterested meeting of friends. Sometime, perhaps, we may be able to get together, but not here and especially now. Believe me, Alice, as friend to friend, love, Esther. While Pickett fought the takeover in court, the last nail was driven into the colony's coffin. For some years, Doc Williams had been in touch with mineralogists. The Revolutionary Board instituted a series of costly ventures trying to find oil at the colony. Parish after parish in Louisiana had struck oil, but there was no oil at New Yano. The colony, like so many other enterprises in depression-ridden America, went broke, trying to strike it rich. A lot of people criticized George for the way he ran things, but these people didn't have a, a better idea. It all went to, they said during the Depression, the country going to hell in a handbasket. Well, uh, Yana went to hell in a handbasket by people that didn't have a better idea. By 1937, after a long and bitter fight, the courts reinstated Pickett as the legal general manager. But it was too late. 
In desperation and revenge, a number of revolutionaries called in their claims to mortgages, forcing the colony into bankruptcy. Lawyers descended upon them. The colony in Louisiana apparently uh, maintained no corporate. It was a corporation, but it didn't maintain the traditional corporate structure. It didn't do a lot of things that uh, normally a corporation would do, like keep track of their, their stockholders. And at one point, the, the, the courts just threw up the hands and said, we can't make anything out of this. We don't even know who owns it. In 1939, a court-appointed receiver sold the colony, plus over 70 industrial buildings and their contents, including the print shop, sheet metal factory, theater, blacksmith shop, filling station, hospital, library, hotel, all for $6,600. After 25 years, Llano del Rio Cooperative Colony was dead. The lawsuits continued for almost 40 years. The timing, the depression, World War II, uh, it changed everybody's life. It was a mixture of, of a lot of things. It was a mixture of greed and envy and uh, people who wanted to ride, get a free ride, and different things like this was what broke up Yano Colony. I don't think anybody made money. No, I really don't think any one person made money. Um, Pickett probably got credit for making more in um, some of the business deals, but if there were any money made, it went right back into fighting this receivership. It was paid to some attorney. The human nature just wouldn't let something like that work. It'll only work if you get a small group that uh, pays in their money and keep it small, and then it'll work. It'll work because they want it to work. They wanted to believe what they were led to believe about the colony. And when it didn't always turn out that way, they, they weren't vindictive. They did not reject socialism, per se, because the Yano colony failed. They did not reject utopianism. They gained something, and they, they tried to see that something as more important than, than what they had lost. Former colonists, once bitter enemies, now reunited to fight in the courts to regain Yano's assets. George Pickett, Doc Williams, Anna Luttrell, Albert Capazzi, and others fought the receivership in court for over 35 years. One time after another, they lost. Their story, the colony's history, disappeared. Ironically, its erasure from even Louisiana history was so complete, even those who lived there have a hard time believing it ever happened. The older I get, the more I think about, about uh, that, that short time experience, how it was just like a, a whole lifetime. We just it was it was very brief, but it would just seem like it was it was much, much longer. Sometimes you feel more like it was a dream more than a reality. Why has our history been written as if the building of America were a simple matter? Why have the contributions of radicals such as Tom Paine, the industrial workers of the world, and Joe Paraman been pushed aside? The writing of, of history particularly local history, is a matter of the victor writing the story. And in our case, in, in West Louisiana, in the Vernon Parish, uh, New Lano area, uh, the victor was not the colony. Well, I think the most important lesson of Yano is less what happened to them very predictably in the face of the immensely powerful opposition they faced in one of the most intolerant moments in American history than the audacity of what they tried to do. And the fact that so much of what Yano represented corresponds so, so very well with major aspirations of common people in American history. And that without radicals and utopias, there, there can't be even a, a minimum of, of progress. What the Yano colonists were doing is almost identical to what the Puritan fathers were doing in Massachusetts in 1630. Uh, those people were living a communal life, and they were living a, a life which was far more socialistic 
than um, than Yano ever achieved. We simply say that they are they're talking about a religious ideal rather than a, a secular ideal. But the, the end is the same. You, you can't make these things on American. There, there's, there's too much of American history that's been involved. Perhaps these people really had something, that is cooperation, uh, working together. I think that's how they managed to survive, looking out for each other and not just looking out for oneself. And that's, that's part of the American tradition. We, on the one hand, like to believe that we have been a nation of rugged individuals, but the entire frontier from Jamestown to San Francisco was settled and pacified cooperatively. Cooperatively. American presidents from Franklin Roosevelt to Ronald Reagan take credit for bringing into effect the compromises between capital and labor that have made American life the success we know today claiming credit for reforms such as child labor laws, minimum wage laws, and social security. But they are not the ones who forced these ideas upon the American consciousness. Well, I know how we got social security. We were uh, considered Russian Bolsheviks. You know, our shirts were outside of our pants with a belt on. If we made such a suggestion that you have social security, it's very hard for people to believe this today because they take it for granted. But I can assure you that it was hard won. And if it weren't for the liberals, the utopians, the radicals who, who are with us at all times, we probably would all still be swinging from tree to tree and eating each other. Because they're the ones who are behind all changes, not necessarily for the better, but certainly including all changes for the better. And from this came the idea of unemployment compensation, old age insurance, social security, and eventually Medicare, Medicaid, and the other tidbits of socialism. We received the notice about the Yano picnic, but my mother, Mrs. Ewell, and I were unable to attend. It is remarkable how the small group hangs together, from mutual interest, no doubt. Do you have any news from Mr. Cantrell and his family? We haven't heard of him for a long time. In a sense, the obituary of Yano Colony was written by one of Yano's first members, Bert Moore, in a letter to George Pickett in 1958. George, I'm over 80 and slipping fast. The end for me is getting so close that I feel I should not have any obligation to leave up in the air when I go. Lawyers have been our undoing. I don't understand your explanation of the new case, but I do know. Nobody wins a certain number of points in a lawsuit. You either win or lose. Enclosed is my resignation as director and secretary treasurer of Yano del Rio. George, I'm tired, and I feel like my life has been wasted. I've seen letters like that, and I weep when I see letters like that, because for the individual who has put in so many years putting their head against the wall and seeing their, their head beaten against the wall, seeing their efforts upset by others, seeing their efforts repressed by authorities, look back on a life that seems to have no meaning, no significance. And what I offer them is, is a sop, really. And the sop that I offer is history is of the risk takers. These are the examples that propel us propel us to be greater than ourselves, to be greater than our smallest intentions, to be able to be outward looking as opposed to inward looking. And without those examples, despite the pain, the misery that we're talking about, without those examples, it's a brutish race and it's a brutish life. The Yano colonists were pioneers. Almost every social reform they championed is now part and parcel of American life. Who were these people our history chooses to ignore? Harriman. No, I didn't. I can't recall. I might have knew him by his face. What did he do? Anything special? I said to her one day, I said, Martha, do you have a small picture of Job Harriman around or anything? 
And she said, no. I said, well, that picture up there is Joe Harriman. It was Joe Harriman when he was young. What is a man's life? The Townsend Act, the Medicare Act, the Workmen's Compensation Act, the minimum wage laws, the Social Security Act, the child labor laws. This is Joe Harriman, a man you've never heard of. He and tens of thousands of Americans like him have disappeared from our history books. These people were Americans. Major funding for this program was provided by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the California Council for the Humanities. And by the Louisiana Division of the Arts. For more information about this program, study guides, and cassette copies, please contact LPB at area code 504-767-5660 or write to us at 7860 Anselmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810.